Do you remember? And they describe the properties that a set and an operation have in order to be called a group. So our set G and an operation, which are representing for the moment with an asterisk, that's a group if and only if the pair, the, the set and the operation satisfy these four properties. Okay, and we discussed these uh, at length last week. But just very briefly, the set has to be closed under the operation. You take any two elements, combine them with the operation, gives you again an element in the group, an element in the set G. The operation has to be associative. So when you evaluate triple products like that, A star B star C, whichever way you choose to evaluate it pairwise, it leads to the same result. Okay? So we, we, we need that to hold in order to be called a group. There, the third property, the existence of an identity element. There must be a special element in the group. We prove later on that this element is unique. There's only one such element. But anyway, there's, there's a special element in the group such that when you product it with any other element, it leaves the other element unchanged. So E star A is equal to A star E is equal to A. And lastly, every element in the group has an inverse with respect to this operation. So specifically, for every A in G, there exists another element, which we call A inverse in G. And the property that that other element has is when you combine it with A using the operation in either order, you get back this, you get back the identity element, this special element referred to in axiom 3. So that's the general definition. It doesn't refer to any specific type of mathematical object kind of number type object or matrix type object or function type object. It doesn't refer to any particular operation. It's just referring to the general notion of a group, of a set and an operation on it. Okay? We then looked at some immediate consequences of the axiom. The fact that the identity element was unique, the inverse elements are unique, a cancellation law holds, and also the inverse of a product is the product of the inverses in the opposite order, and also general associativity. That's a quick run through some of the basics of abstract group theory. Abstract group theory is, is all about just looking at what are the possibilities for groups, what possible structures flow from the group axioms. That's some of the initial considerations of it there and those initial consequences. So now we want to start looking at some more examples. So we've seen the we've seen the we've seen we've referred to the dihedral symmetry groups. Uh, and I've mentioned in passing that lot, there are lots of groups of number like objects. We've also referred to groups of matrices, uh, groups of matrices, just in passing. So we we want to look at some of these examples in detail. Okay? So first of all, look at some examples of infinite number groups. Okay? So all these pairs here, Z under addition, remember Q represents the rational numbers, R represents the real numbers. So Z, Q, and R under the operation of addition, those are all groups. Consider each of the four axioms in turn. You'll see that each of the four axioms is is satisfied. Look at Z plus, for instance. Is the closure axiom satisfied? If, if you add two integers, do you get another integer? Well, yeah. Is the operation of addition of integers associative? Yeah, it is. Is there an identity element for this set? Well, yeah, there's the integer 0 is the identity element for this, for this first group here. You add 0 to any other integer, leaves the other integer unchanged. Are there inverse elements? Well, yeah, the, the inverse of, a, of an integer z in, in this first group here is the integer negative z. Okay, so when you add z and negative z together, you get back 0, which is the identity of. You can go through each of the four axioms in turn, and you'll see that they're all satisfied. So this is, is indeed a group. As is q under plus and the real numbers under plus. When you come to consider multiplication, though, um, well, the integers aren't going to aren't going to be a group under multiplication. Well, why not? Um, 
there's a problem with some of the axioms. If integers are closed under multiplication, that's fine. Multiplication of integers is associative. Multiplication of numbers, these familiar numbers, is always associative. And there is an identity element for multiplication. Is the integer 1. You multiply any integer by 1, it leaves the other integer unchanged. Problem comes, of course, when you come to consider inverse elements. What's the inverse of 2 with respect to multiplication? So what integer do you multiply by 2 to get back the identity element 1? Well, what you want to say is you want to say a half. You multiply 2 by a half to get 1. But of course, a half isn't an integer. A half isn't present in in the set of integers. So the fourth axiom, the inverse axiom, fails for the case of the integers. Okay? No integer has a multiplicative inverse in the integers except for 1, 1 and minus 1. 1 and minus 1 are their own inverses with respect to multiplication of integers. But if you're considering rational numbers q and real numbers r, well, the inverses with respect to multiplication are going to be the reciprocal elements. The inverse of a rational number q will be 1 over q. When you multiply q by 1 over q, you get back the identity. Similarly, the inverse of a real number r is 1 over r. Except we have to exclude 0, because of course 0 doesn't have a multiplicative identity. If you multiply anything by 0, you get 0. So you're never going to get back the identity element 1. Okay. So under multiplication, you have to consider the non-zero rational numbers and the non-zero real numbers in order to form groups. Okay. So example 4.2, why, do, why does the pair z and multiplication not form a group? Well, I've, I've just said that. It's, it's because of the failure of the axiom 4 about the existence of inverse. Okay. Only the integers plus and minus 1 have inverses in the integers with respect to multiplication. All the other integers don't. Because the, integer, the, the inverse of 3 is 1 over 3. It's a rational number. It's not an integer. Okay? And all these examples are, of course, infinite groups. The set, the underlying set is infinite. What we're kind of more interested in or what you see more kind of um, structure in is finite groups. So what we want to do now is consider the integers and introduce some modified arithmetic operations on them which do produce finite groups. Okay? Now you may well be, uh, you may well be familiar with this concept. So this is the concept of modular arithmetic. Okay? So we fix a number n in this discussion. Fix an integer n which is strictly bigger than 1, say. And then we define operations called addition modulo n and multiplication modulo n as follows. If you have two integers a and b, their sum modulo n is defined to be the integer c that you get when you divide the integer a plus b by the modulus n. So when you divide a plus b by n, it's going to go in a certain number of times, and then there's going to be a remainder left over. And that remainder will be between 0 and n minus 1, inclusive. Okay. We take the integers a and b, we add them in the usual way, then we divide this sum by the integer n, and take the non-negative remainder c. So c is the small remainder that's left after you divide something by n, after you divide a plus b by n. The c lies greater than or equal to 0 and strictly less than n. The largest remainder you can get would be n minus 1. If you did get a remainder of n, well, then you could have divided it in one more time. So, so this number c, we, we, this number c we use as the output of the operation. So a plus b, we say it's equal to c modulo n. And we can write it like that. A modular multipli multiplication is done in exactly uh, the same way. You take the two integers b, and to multiply them modulo n, first you multiply them as normal. You get a large number, perhaps. Then you divide it by n, and you take the small remainder, the remainder between 0 and n minus 1, uh, which is left after you divide a times b by n. 
and that we refer to as the product of A and B modulo N. And you can write it like this, A times B is equal to C modulo N. Okay. So then we have the additive. So the, you, using these two operations, we can define two groups. And these are called the modular arithmetic groups. Okay. So under addition modulo n, so we still use the same symbol plus and multiplication for it. Okay. So Zn plus, that's the group. So the set Zn refers to the set of possible remainders modulo n. And the set 0, 1, 2, 3, up as far as n minus 1. They're the possible elements you can have as remainders after you divide by the integer n. So those are the elements of the group, and the operation we use is addition modulo n. Okay, so, so the way we define addition modulo n, if you add any two things, you always get a remainder between 0 and n minus 1. So if we add any of these two elements using this operation, we'll again get one of these elements. Okay, so that's called the additive group modulo, modulo n. We'll, we'll investigate some examples now in, in a moment, but we'll just say something about the multiplicative one. Um, well, the definition of the multiplicative group is not so straightforward. Um, I mean, you could just say, you, you could consider that set Zn under multiplication. Closure is no problem. If you do multiply any of those two remainders, modulo n, you will get another remainder between 0 and n minus 1. Um, it is associative. There is an identity element. 1 is going to be the identity element. But the problem is when you come to, when you come to consider the notion of inverse. Well, 0 isn't going to have an inverse, for instance. When you multiply anything modulo n by 0, you're again going to get 0. 0 won't have an inverse, but plenty of other elements um, plenty of other elements won't have inverses as well. So sometimes numbers have an inverse modulo n, sometimes they don't. Um, let, you know, just look at some examples. If you consider the multiplicative inverse of 2 modulo 5, well, that's going to be 3. Because 2 by 3 is 6, which is the same as 1 modulo 5. And 1 is the identity element that you want to get. So 2 and 3 are inverses of each other, modulo, modulo 5. Modulo 8 you find that 3 is its own inverse modulo 8. 3 by 3 gives you 9, which is 1 modulo 8. So 3 by 3 is the identity modulo 8. So 3 is its own inverse. However, if you try and find an inverse for 2 modulo 8, you won't be able to find one. You multiply 2 by all of the elements, 0, 1, 2, up as far as 7, you never get 1 modulo 8. And there are lots of other examples. Here's just another positive example. 5 modulo 11. The inverse of 5 modulo 11 is 9. When you multiply 5 by 9, you get 45. And 45 is equal to 1 modulo 11. You divide it by 11, it goes in four times. And there's a remainder of 1 left over. So 5 and 9 are inverses of each other. Now, it is easy to. We, we can understand very well when a number has a multiplicative inverse modulo n and when it doesn't. And that's contained in this uh, paragraph here. An integer a will only have an inverse under multiplication modulo n if and only if a is co-prime to n. So being co-prime means that that means that a and n share no common factors apart from one. You look at all the you look at all the numbers that divide into a and n. The only one in common for them, if if the only one in common is one, then a will have a multiplicative inverse modulo n. But if there is a if they have a non-trivial divisor in common, i.e. something bigger than one, then then there won't be a multiplicative inverse for a modulo n. You can observe that happening here with 2, because 2 and 8, of course, the greatest common divisor of 2 and 8 is 2. 2 divides into 2, and 2 divides into 8. Okay. 
Now in the in the second year course, number theory and cryptography, we fully investigate these and we prove lots of things about divisibility and these modular arithmetic groups. They're uh, they're used as a way to study prime numbers. Um, so we do lots of work with them in the number theory and cryptography unit. So in order to form a group in order to form a group under multiplication modulo n, you have to kick out everything which doesn't have an inverse. Just as we kicked that kick zero out when we wanted to form a group under multiplication in, with the rationals of the real numbers. If you're starting off with this underlying set Zn and you want to form a group out of these elements under multiplication, you have to get rid of everything which it doesn't have an inverse. So this set, this is the multiplicative group Zn, the underlying group of it. So we, we use Zn and we put a subscript of the multiplication sign. This refers to all the remainders modulo n, but only those which are co-prime to n. So only those which don't share any factors uh, at all with n. Okay. So Z, uh, the multiplicative group Zn is the set of a, the set of integers a such that a lies between 1 and n, or you could change that between 1 and n minus 1 if you wanted, because n is all is n is never co-prime with itself. If n is bigger than 1, so it always has the factor n in common with itself. So um, this will just consist, this set Zn, multiplicative group set Zn, will just consist of all the number, all the remainders from here, which, have, which are co-prime to n. And once you've done that modification, then it will form a group under multiplication. It will be closed. It will be um, associative. Well, the operation of multiplication is always associative. Multiplication of these numbers. Um, there will be an identity. The identity element is 1. And everything will have an inverse. Okay. So let's look at, um, yes, yeah, so this, this, this leads us to Definition 4.6. This is our multiplicative group. Um, and we've already done Cayley tables. We, 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 we investigated Cayley tables with... Um, we investigated Cayley tables when we looked at the dihedral group. But just to remind you, um, in, in, in a moment we're going to look at example 4.4. But um, when we look at those examples, we'll do the Cayley tables as well. So a Cayley table for a group... You can call it a Cayley table or a multiplication table for the group. It's a table which shows the operation, shows all the values of the operation uh, on the group. Okay? So you typically just use it for smallish, finite groups. Um, you need an agreement about... So you, you, you use the elements of the group as the column headings and the row headings. And then you need to have a convention about which product goes in which cell of the table. So in the row GI and the column GJ, we put the product GI times GJ. And we need, that con we, we need to agree a convention about which order, how you order the elements. So you put the row element on the left and the column element on the right. We need that convention in general for groups because groups aren't always commutative. Remember, commutative, an operation is commutative if it always takes the same value, if a product always has the same value if you reorder the elements. Okay? Now, these addition modulo n and multiplication modulo n operations are always uh, commutative. So this convention isn't needed because the product gi times gj will be equal to gj times gi in these groups. That's not the case for every group. So, um, so we do need to have this uh, convention about the Cayley tables. But it, it agrees with the convention you use for indexing entries of a matrix. Remember, if you have matrix A, you refer to the entry inside A of Aij. And the first element I is the refers to which row, the ith row. And the second element J refers to the jth column. So it's, it's just the same convention which, uh, which we're using here. 
So let's just have a have a an investigation of some of these modular uh, multiplication groups. There's a few listed over the page Z8 and Z5. Let's look at a few of the other ones. This is example 4.4, isn't it? So, I mean, let's look at um, let's look at Z four. So, Z four, <clears throat> the multiplicative group, just consists of those integers a, such that one is less than or equal to a is less than or equal to four, and the greatest common divisor of a with four is one. Well, that will consist of just 1 and 3. We don't, cons we don't include 2 because 2 has a common factor of 2 with 4. And we don't include 4 itself because well, we never include the last number itself. So, so we're just left with 1 and 3. That's going to have a nice compact Cayley table. It's just a group with two elements in it. So this is multiplication modulo 4. You could maybe put a subscript of 4 in the multiplication sign to indicate that. And I mean, it's really, that's all there is to the Cayley table. Multiply 1 by anything, you get the other thing. You multiply 3 by 3, you get 9, which is, of course, 1 modulo 4. 9 is, congr nine is congruent or equivalent to 1 modulo 4. So, I mean, that's not that exciting a group. It's just a group of two elements. All groups with two elements are essentially the same. Their Cayley tables will look will just be a relabeling of that one. Not the most boring group. The, the most boring group in the world is just this one. It just consists of one, one element, which has to be the identity, and the identity times itself is the identity. That's the boring group, or the trivial group as its technical term. But there's nothing really else you can say about the trivial group. Um, so what would Z6 be? What would be the elements in Z6? So the numbers between 1 and 6, which are co-prime to 6. Well, this is very similar to Z4, because there are only two of them. It's just 1 and 5. You can't have 2, you can't have 3, because they share common factors with 6, and you can't have 6 itself. And this Cayley table, well, you can see here how it's really just going to be a relabeling. It's just a relabeling of this one here, where 5 takes the place of 3. Skip number two, Z5. Maybe I should look at that. Well, here things get a little bit more interesting because five is a prime number. So none of the numbers less than five uh, share, a common, sh share a common factor with five apart from one. Number one divides everything. So everything has a any pair of numbers their common divisor, the greatest common divisor is at least one. Okay. Um, so these are the elements of Z5. So, okay, so this is four elements in it, so it's it's going to be a bit more interesting. So we're doing multiplication modulo five. So every every element we put in the cell of this table has to be between, well, has to be one of these elements. 1, 2, 3, or 4. You multiply things by 1, you just get this, the other thing. So that's, you can fill the first row in the first column. That's just a repeat of the, of the row headings. Normally, we make sure that we put the identity element first. It's a kind of a convention. When you multiply things by 2, well, 2 by 2 is 4. 
2 by 3 is 6, but of course 6 is equivalent to 1, modulo 5. And 2 by 4 is 8, which is equivalent to 3. Multiply things by 3. 3 by 2 is 6, which is 1. 3 by 3 is 9, which is 4, modulo 5. And 3 by 4 is 12, which is 2, modulo 5. When you divide 12 by 5, you get a remainder of 2. And when you multiply everything by 4, you get 3, 2, and 1. 4 by 2 is 8, which is 3, modulo 5. 4 by 3 is 12, which is 2. And 4 by 4 is 16, which is uh, 16 is 1, modulo 5. You can start to make some observations here. And this observation turns out to be true for every group, is that every row and column every row and column in the body of the table, not including the not including the, the column headings or the row headings. Every row and column in the body of the table. What am I going to make? What observation am I going to make about the row, every row and column, do you think? Anything significant you notice about every row and every column? Same element? Yeah, well, we knew that was going to happen from the beginning. The symmetry. Or maybe you're referring to this thing. They contain every element once and only once. Because you never get a repetition in, a, in any row or column. So every row and column in the body of the table contains every element once and only once. You can prove this. I won't go through it now. I can maybe leave it as an exercise for you. So prove this using the cancellation law. That was theorem 4.3. Do it as a proof by contradiction. You could suppose, suppose you had some Cayley table where there was a repeated element. You'd actually be able to prove that, well, that that led to a contradiction. Okay, so that's true of every group. If you look in the if you if you turn to the page uh, thirty thirty six, okay, we've we've gone through the examples at five. Page thirty six also has the group Z8. And here you here we're faced with um, here we're faced with an important type of question which group theory spends a lot of its time trying to answer. Okay, the the elements which are co-prime to eight are one, three, five, and seven. So you exclude 2, 4, and 6, because they all share a common factor of 2 or 4 with 8. When you're working modulo 8, you're just looking at 1, 3, 5, and 7. So a very natural question in group theory is when you're faced with these two groups, they're, they're, they're both groups of four elements. Each group has four elements. So a natural question would be is, how similar are these as groups? Are they, in fact, the same group? Whereby saying they're the same group, we mean, is one group just a simple relabeling of the other one? Right? Or are they significantly different? Do they have significant differences in their group structure? 
Because like when we looked at, it's a much smaller example, but when we looked at Z6 and Z4, although they're different groups, there's different things in them, but for all intents and purposes, just as groups, they are, they have the same group structure. Because this one is just a relabeling of this one. Just five is playing the role of three here. Okay? But it's a bit harder to answer that question when you're looking at Z, Z5 and Z8. So, so could anybody answer that question? Are, should we consider these groups as being the same? Or do they have significantly different group structure? Any, any thoughts on that or things to say about that? It again? You think it's similar to the other example? So are, are you saying that, that one of the tables is just a relabeling of the other one? Sorry? You think so in this one? Is anybody else? No? What? Why do you say no? What is it about it that Makes you disagree. Yeah. Yeah, so that's an interesting observation. So what you said was when you look at the diagonal in the group Z8. What that, what's that saying is, is that when you take the product of any element with itself in Z8, you always get the identity element. Remember, the, the identity element is the one special element in the group. It's the group which leaves everything else unchanged when you operate on anything else with it. But that doesn't happen in, in Z5. OK, the product of 4 with itself, 4 by 4 is 16, which is equivalent to 1 mod 5. But 2 by 2 is 4, so that's a non-identity element. 3 by 3 is 4, that's a non-identity non element. So that is an example of some group structure which is different in the two things. So I think we should regard these, we should regard these as being significantly different as groups, or as not being equivalent. There's a technical term used for that. It's called isomorphic. If, if two groups are the same completely, if one is just a relabeling of the other, then we, we say it's isomorphic to the other one. So this is an example of non-isomorphic groups. In particular, or one way of really making it very clear what the difference is, is that in Z5, you can actually write all the elements of Z5 as powers of 2. Because 2 to the 0, that gives you 1, yeah? 2 to the 1 gives you 2. 2 cubed gives you... Um, 2 cubed gives you... 2 cubed gives you the integer 8, but modulo 5, 8 is the same as 3. I skipped out 2 squared. Why did I skip out 2 squared? 2 squared is 4. And 2 to the power of 4 is 16, which is 1. So when you do 2 to the power of 4, that brings you back to the start. And you just continue scanning through those elements. So what we say here is this shows that Z5 is generated by 2. There's, there's one element in there, and if you look at all the powers of that element, that generates the group. It's also generated by 
which is the other one which will do a three, also generated by three. Whereas in Z8, we don't have this feature. If you, so the elements are one, three, five, and seven. If you look at powers of three, three to the zero is one, three to the zero is one, three to the one is three, three squared is nine, which again gets you back to one. So you just, you, using three, you can only generate two elements. Like that's the same for all the, all the non-identity elements in Z8. When you look at five, five to the zero is one, five to the one is five. As soon as you go to five squared, you're back to one again. And the same with seven. Seven to the zero is, is one. Seven to the, to the one is seven. But seven squared is 49, which is again one modulo eight. So eight is not generated by any of its elements. So it's not generated by any one of its elements. This leads us nicely to definition 4.9. This example where the group is generated by a single element, this is called a cyclic group. And when it's not the case, that's called a a non-cyclic group. A cyclic group is a group which you can find in it elements which are called generators. Elements whose powers under the operation generate the whole group. And here we're interpreting these indexes as being as referring to whatever the group operation is. So two cubed means two by two by two but the operation you're using is the group operation. So you can always talk, you, you can always use this multiplicative notation, this power notation. I gave a separate, uh, separate discussion of that multiplicative notation there in section 4.6, but it's, it's really just using, writing things as if they were a multiplication and using powers just to refer to repeated use of the group operation. So these are two, ver these are, being a cyclic group, being cyclic is quite special in mm -hmm. terms of the group, and it makes it very easy to understand, um, understand the group structure. Because any two, any two finite groups of n elements, which are cyclic, so if you have two groups consisting of n elements, but if they're cyclic, if each one has a generator, then their group structure is the same. Because each one just consists of all the n powers of its particular generator. And the, having a set of n powers of a single element, that just leads to having exactly the same, uh, exactly the same group structure. So cyclic groups of the same size are regarded as, as being equivalent groups. No, no, so non being non-cyclic means that you, you, you lack this feature of being generated by a single element. So that means the possibilities are a lot richer for the type of structure that the group can have. Yeah. So being non-cyclic is the general type of behavior. Being cyclic is, is quite a special feature. OK. And um, there's a few more definitions on page, in that section, on page 36 and page 37, which you should read through. 
the multiplicative notation, that just sets up formally the idea of using powers of an element to refer to repeating the group operation the appropriate number of times. We define a cyclic group there, just in the same way we defined it there. You can also talk about cyclic subgroups. So in any group, if you just pick any element out of the group, you can look at the set of elements that are generated by that particular element you, you picked out. And that will give you a subgroup, a smaller group sitting within the larger group. Okay? So that's something we're going to explore. And the order of an element, the order of an element refers to the size of the cyclic subgroup that it generates. The number of elements in the cyclic subgroup generated by that element. Okay. So if you look at the exercises then, I think the first two exercises are available to us now. And some of the other ones will be after Thursday evening. So it's just to investigate some of these additive groups and multiplicative groups for various moduli. And um, See which ones you find that are cyclic, which ones require more than one generator, and also investigate some of the subgroups in them. Just generally have an explore of these uh, finite groups, okay? So I'll see you again on Thursday evening when we look at some more examples of groups, other mathematical contexts in which we have groups, okay?